Hello, everybody. Once again, I'm so happy that you chose to join us for our Bible study. Let us pray. Most holy and gracious Father, once again, we come asking that you would open our hearts and our minds to receive your fresh. In Jesus' name, amen. So we are still on article number 12, the harmony of the law and the gospel. And our author writes, <clears throat> we believe that the law of God is the eternal and unchangeable rule of his moral government, that it is holy, just, and good, and that the inability which the scripture ascribes to fallen men to fulfill its precepts arises entirely from their love of sin, to deliver them from which, and to restore them through a mediator to unfeigned obedience of, to the holy law is one great end of the gospel and of the means of grace connected with the establishment of the visible church. And so we are continuing today, <clears throat> excuse me, with Galatians, the third chapter, verses 19 through 25. And it reads, and this is the NIV version, it reads, what then was the purpose of the law? It was added because of transgressions until the seed to whom the promise referred had come. The law was put into effect through angels by a mediator. A mediator, however, does not represent just one party, but God is one. Is the law therefore opposed to the promises of God? Absolutely not. For if a law had been given that could impart life, then righteousness would certainly have come by the law. But the scripture declares that the whole world is a prisoner of sin, so that what, so that what was promised being given through faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Before this faith came, we were held prisoners by the law, locked up until faith should be revealed. So the law was put in charge to lead us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. Now that faith has come, we are no longer under the supervision of the law. And so last time, we started with the question that was asked in verse 19. What then was the purpose of the law? And Paul said that it was added because of transgression until the seed to whom the promise referred had come. And so that led to the question, what was the promise and to whom was it given? And that led us to Genesis the 12th chapter verses 1 through 3 uh, to look at the promise given to Abraham and his seed. So Genesis, the thir uh, 12th chapter, verses 1 through 3, and today we're going to add verse 7, and we're going to read it from the King James Version, uh, which reads, Now the Lord has said to Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. And then verse 7, <clears throat> And the Lord appeared unto Abram, and said, un and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And there builded he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. So <clears throat> Abram's, and, and I'll say once again, I said it last time, but I'll say once again that I will interchange Abram and Abraham, uh, realizing that Abram's, Abraham's name started as Abram and, and then God changed it to Abraham. The same with Sarah. Her name started as Sarai and God changed it to Sarah. So I am going to interchange it because I'm just so used to Abraham and Sarah. So when I say Abraham and it should be Abram or Sarah and it should be Sarai, we're okay, right? So Abram's story began with a command and a promise from God. The command is to separate himself from his kinfolk and those around him. And last time we put a pin there and talked about the hard reality of, of doing that and, and how in the beginning of his journey, 
he had his father and nephew along for the journey. And I read a commentary this week from a 17th century preacher named Thomas Fuller. And I thought pretty much, I thought what he said pretty much summed up Tara, Lot, and Abraham and Sarah. He said, and I quote, that all mankind was divided into three classes, the intenders, the endeavors, and the performers. He said that Tara may have been an intender, but he never made it into the land of promise. Lot was an endeavorer up to a point, but he fell miserably because he could not walk by faith. Then Abraham and Sarah were the performers because they trusted God to perform what he promised. They committed their lives and future to God, obeyed what he commanded, and received all that God planned for them. And, and, and we should give that some soul searching, some thoughts, and, and ask ourselves, what class am I in? Am I an intender or endeavorer or performer? My guess is that most of us would fall in the first and second class. Uh, an elderly lady that I loved and who have gone on to be with the Lord once told me, she said that good intentions don't mean a hill of beans unless you follow through. And, and as far as Gump would say, that's all I got to say about that. So today we are removing the pen and we are moving on. So God's promises to Abraham or to Abram began in Genesis, the 12th chapter, verses one through three. But his promise, his promises unfold throughout the remainder of the book of Genesis. In, in Genesis, the 12th chapter, verses one through three, God promised to Abram had several clauses, seven clauses to it. He said, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great. You shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And that last clause clearly shows that Abraham will be important in the fulfillment of the divine plan for humanity. Then verse seven says, and the Lord appeared unto Abram and said unto, and said unto thy seed will I give this land. And there builded he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. That's important to Note that some time has passed between verse three and verse seven. Abram has packed up, left Haran, and arrived in Canaan. And it should also be noted that in Haran, God had blessed him with possessions and people that work for him. So he was already rich or beginning to be rich. And because Lot was with him, he was blessed as well. So in your mind, picture Abraham, Sarah, Lot, all their possessions, which would include cattle, sheep, whatever they had, you know, camels, whatever he had during that time. But it would include all of that and the people that they had acquired a picture of that, all that big crowd entering into Canaan. In my mind, they are noticeable. They didn't just slip in. And also know that even though God has given the land to Abram and his descendants, right now, the Canaanites are in the land. And if, if you have studied the Canaanites in any way or remember them from, from Bible studies and different things, you know that the Canaanites are not nice people. So Abraham enters the land of, uh, on a promise from God. He arrives in the land and shows his faith in that promise. 
He, he shows his faith by checking out what God had given him. The Bible says in verse six that Abram passed through the land to the place of Shechem as far as the terebinth tree of Moreh. Now, right here, that might not seem like a thing of importance, but it is. It's like at times when I'm watching a movie uh, that my younger son has already seen, he will prompt me at times and like, pay attention to this or, or uh, you need to remember that for later references. And, and verse six is one of those times. Shechem will be the place of some major events. In, in fact, Shechem was in uh, central Canaan. It was lying in a valley between Mount Ebal and Mount Gezerim which is where Joshua would stand hundreds of years later and read to Abraham's descendants the blessings of obeying the Lord and the curses if they don't. My point is that to Abraham, he may not have, he may have just been exploring the land that uh, would one day belong to his descendants, but God is working his plan. He, he, it would be over 400 years before Abraham's descendants actually received the land. But Abraham being there, Abraham being there was com, a confirmation that God had done what he promised he would do. Think, think about where you are today and then think about how you got there. And, and, and follow the hand of God bringing you there. Most of us didn't just make a straight shot. You know, most of us went through curves and turns and uphills and downhills and around some corners and through some valleys, you know. And, and, and the, think about the people that may now be in your past that were instrumental in God's plan. That at the time, you just thought, they were there. You just thought it was happenstance. But God is working his plan for our lives. And most often, we don't see it until farther down the road. When we look back, the songwriter said, my soul looked back in wonder, W-O-N-D-E-R, meaning amazement. He says, my soul looked back in wonder how I got over. In other words, times were so rough that when I look back at the stuff I've gone through, I'm in total amazement how I even survived. So, so Abraham looks over the land with the faith of ownership while the Canaanites still live there. There was no plan of, uh, of, of moving you know, the Canaanites had no plan of moving. They, Abraham didn't come in and they said, oh, we got to go. No, they had no plan of moving, which means that it was also dangerous. The faith chapter of, of Hebrew 11 tells us that Abraham arrived as a stranger and a pilgrim in the land of promise, in the land that God had given him. He, he didn't arrive like the Fresh Prince of Bel Air. You know, for those of you too young or too old to relate to that, just move on. Don't, don't even try to get it. But that's amazing to me. But it shows how awesome God is. God's plan to bring Abraham out so that he could bring him in. Abraham's faith brought him out and his faith brought him in. Without faith, we would be reading a whole different scenario. And so God's plan and Abraham's faith merged together and landed Abraham in the promised land in the midst of a pagan society. Then verse 7 says, And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And there he builded he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. My point in, in all of this is that at this time, Canaan didn't look like, yeah, I just won the jackpot. This is great. No, Abraham couldn't go in putting folk 
out and moving in. He went in by faith and by faith claimed his inheritance. Can you imagine the assurance felt by Abraham after arriving in this strange and dangerous land to have a new revelation from God? I, I would imagine that after traveling around in the land and, and probably seeing all sorts of things in that pagan society, I don't know about Abram, but I would have been thinking, God, you brought me over a thousand miles for this. Why couldn't you just let me stay in the land of the Ur of the Chaldeans? Them folk were doing the same as the Canaanites. Abram had to have been restored. He had to have been overjoyed by a visit from God reassuring him of his promise. God said, unto thy seed will I give this land. That tells me that what I see is not always what I get, especially if I'm looking through my physical eyes. You know, remember by the time uh, his descendants arrived in Canaan, they, it was called the land of milk and honey. And I don't think right now Abraham is thinking, wow, this is the land of milk and honey. So, so when you think about Canaan, God has given each one of us a Canaan. And, and the only way to obtain it is through faith. In the physical, it may not look like much. It, it may require us going through some different tests, some temptations, some challenges, some battles. But as the saying go, if God led you to it, he will lead you through it. Paul in Philippians, the first verse, uh, first chapter, verse six, the NIV, Paul says that same thing like this. He says, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to the completion until the day of Christ Jesus. For most of us, God is not commanding us to pull up stakes and, and go to a strange land. But the challenges to our faith are just as real. Sometimes there are serious problems in our homes, on our jobs, and even in the church. So much so that we wonder why God would allow these things to happen to me. After all, God does want me to be happy, right? 